in the last class I told that uh, I will be doing the video and then we will be putting up but then I could not do so because uh, of internet problem in my house so we will start off here and uh, I, will, I will try to put the videos or else I won't be able to finish up the syllabus <coughs> and I First time here in Nilay University, and I just prepared because I don't want to talk unnecessary things, so so that I can stay within the course and what you are required to know. Because as you will be studying, so more, many of the things you won't know because you are not being taught about digital. You don't know any of these things, so I need to you know change and put focus on the things that you need to know at the same time must not go beyond what it is required so that is why I just prepared and uh, these notes and based on these notes I will be taking this class <coughs> for this uh, whole uh, book so we'll start off with the uh, basic uh, instruments that are used for measuring current voltage and resistance so basically we will be looking into uh, the Arsenal meter what we have specifically studied I think in your electricity right you have studied in, in your electricity regarding ammeter voltmeter so initially we will be looking into those part and then we will be moving so if we need to measure the current will be using the ammeter if we need to measure the voltage we need to use the voltmeter if we want to measure the resistance in that case we need to use the ohmmeter and the entire working principle of each of this is based on galvanometer and more specifically we call it d arsenal meter so we'll be looking into that so in the first part in the first page Rather, you can see here the thing that we will be measuring ammeter with the ammeter will be measuring the current current is measured in terms of ampere ampere the unit for voltmeter uh, with voltmeter we will be measuring the voltage the unit is volt and the, the ohmmeter will be measuring the resistance that is uh, the ohm value so we'll try to look into the basic measuring device D arsenal meter so if you look at the construction of the D arsenal meter it has got permanent magnet and this permanent magnet is horseshoe magnet and the shape is a bit cylindrical as you can see here and the cylindrical construction is to ensure that the magnetic flux remain concentrated so for concentrated magnetic field we need to use this cylindrical configuration and then you can see here we have got something called the core and around that core we have got some windings so this winding is what we call as the moving coil now if we allow electric current to pass through this moving coil and then because this electric coil is surrounded by the permanent magnet and this permanent magnet would have its own magnetic flux and whenever the electric current flows through this uh, moving coil it would generate its magnetic field as well because with the current as we know the current will induce magnetic field and vice versa so both the magnetic field will interact with each other and once the magnetic field interact with each other it will generate some torque now in this moving coil instrument it is this core is also known as spindle in certain book you will find the term spindle in certain book you will find core so attached to this core or the spindle is the uh, pointer and depending on the intensity of the current the pointer would move and that's how we can measure the uh, any type of fluctuation so any type of fluctuation is measured using this principle 
So what is the basic principle? We have got the permanent magnet. This permanent magnet would interfere with the magnetic field generated by the current which flows in this moving coil. When both this magnetic field interacts, so the pointer would move and that would show the amount of or the sensitivity of the instrument. And it can also be used to measure the current voltage and the resistance by changing certain configuration of this basic instrument. It is one of the most primitive instrument and it definitely it is uh, an uh, analog instrument and not digital instrument. Now, the basic difference between digital and analog instrument is in analog instrument we are using current as the input. In digital we are using potential as the input. All digital works on potential V as the input whereas uh, the analog use current as the input. Next, what you need to remember is what is the purpose of the cylindrical configuration. So, the purpose of having cylindrical configuration is to concentrate the magnetic flux or the field. Next, what you need to remember? The deflection. The rate of deflection is proportional to the amount of current or the intensity of the current. More the intensity of the current, more will be the deflection. Now, whenever the current moves in this moving coil, and as you know, it would generate the magnetic flux of its own. Now, this magnetic flux will have same polarity as that of the permanent magnet and because of which it would deflect. Now, this deflection need to be taken care of and to take care of this deflection, we will have the spring. So, the spring will take care of this deflection forces. Now, this moving coil is wound around some aluminium frame. Now this aluminium frame will move back and forth and in doing so, it would also generate its own eddy current. Now this eddy current again would oppose its own field. In other words, we can say this eddy current now would oppose the movement and this opposing of the movement will provide the damping force for the oscillation so it won't oscillate so in order to prevent any oscillation of the pointer we are using this eddy current effect so you need to remember what is the purpose of having the eddy current effect in order to reduce or in order to do away with the oscillation you need to remember what is the function of the spring the function of the spring is to restrain the deflection pointer deflection and it is proportional to the intensity of the current the pointer deflection is proportional to the intensity of the current next you need to remember what are the different types of forces involved Now, how can we check and know the direction of the uh, induced EMF? So, quite natural, we can know that using the Fleming's left control. So, we'll be using the Fleming's left hand rule. Well, this stands for the motion, this is the field, and this is the current. Father, mother, child. So what are the forces involved? So the first is the deflecting force. Deflecting force means what is causing the pointer to move. So what force is causing the pointer to move? It is the electromagnetic force. You need to remember that. Now this electromagnetic force is depending on what factors? It is depending on the magnitude of the current it is also depending on the direction of the current. So magnitude as well as the direction of the current is what responsible for deflecting the pointer. Now, the magnetic force which is cutting the core is also generating the electric field. And this electric field is acting on the 
moving coil. And all the current which enters or leaves the moving coil is via some calibrated hairspring. You need to remember that. The current enters and leaves via calibrated hairspring. So what is the purpose of the calibrated hairspring? In order for the current to go inside and to leave, we are using the calibrated hairspring. And because the current creates its own magnetic field and this magnetic field is having the same polarity and this is opposing its field and this is the deflecting force so whenever we are talking about the deflecting force that means the force which is deflecting the pointer what force is deflecting the pointer it is the electromagnetic force this electric electromagnetic force is depending on what factors it is depending on the magnitude and the amount of uh, or the amount of current which is moving into the moving coil so more the current which is going into the moving coil more is the deflection this current is moving into the moving coil through what through the calibrated ear spring and this current is generating its own magnetic flux and field and this field polarity is exactly same to the polarity of the original magnet permanent magnet and that is why there is this deflection and it is retained by this deflection is taken care of by the spring so you can see here the spring has got two function along with restraining it is also allowing the current to go inside and to exit the current so the spring has got two function you need to remember both the function the first function is it is restraining and the second function is it is allowing the current to go inside and to let the current move out next is the controlling force so whenever we are looking at the controlling force what basically we are looking at we are looking at the mechanical force so it is the force generated by this spring so controlling force is the force or the mechanical force what is generated what is being generated by this spring whenever we talk about deflection force this deflection force is because of electromagnetic uh, forces Whereas the controlling force is a mechanical force. It has got nothing to do with the electromagnetic. Controlling force is opposing the deflecting force. So because of the deflecting force, the pointer would start deflecting. But then what we want is, this pointer must not oscillate, first of all. And if this pointer must not oscillate, so there must be a force which is opposing this deflecting force. So what is the force which is opposing it? It is the force generated by the spring. So the spring force is the controlling force which is preventing oscillation of the pointer. Now, if the deflecting force is removed, the pointer returned back to its normal position is because of the controlling force. Because now we have got only one force which is the controlling force so if there is no deflecting forces it will return back to its original position because of the controlling force remember this controlling force is always opposing the deflection so if the deflection happens this way controlling force will be in opposite direction if it is going like this controlling force will be in opposite direction so controlling force and deflection force are always opposing each other so if the deflection force is this way controlling force will be in this direction if it is moving like this this will be the direction of the controlling force so it is because of the controlling force that the pointer moves back to its normal position neutral position next is we also have counterweights in order to have greater control of the pointer we need to use the counterweight you need to remember the purpose of the counterweight what is it used for? For more control of the pointer, greater control of the pointer. Now the pivoting point, we need to reduce the friction. So all the pivots will have uh, some glass or some stone type material so that the friction can be reduced. So the connection to this moving coil is via the spiral spring 
which provides this controlling force. And if there is no controlling force, so remember two conditions, if controlling, if there is no deflection force, it would return back because of the controlling force, it would return back to its original position. And next is, if there is no controlling force, what could be hap what can happen? So if there is no controlling force, there is only deflection force, that means it will keep on going and going. Okay? So it won't stop. It would go beyond its limitation. So there will be full scale deflection. So every time, whatever the amount of current you are measuring, you will always have full scale deflection. So the question that could be asked is, if there is a full scale deflection, so what probably is the cause? Irrespective of whatever the amount of current you are measuring, if there is full scale deflection. So if there is a full scale deflection, that means there is no controlling force. And if there is no controlling force, that means the problem is with the spring. So the question that could be asked is, if there is a full scale deflection irrespective of the amount of uh, the quantity you are measuring, so what basically that indicates? So that indicates that the controlling force is not acting. If the controlling force is not acting, that means what could be the possible reason? Probably the spring is not functioning. Because it is the spring which is providing the controlling force. Next is the damping force. Now, where, from where we are getting the damping force? Yeah. I have mentioned that the aluminium frame is generating the eddy current. So it is this eddy current which is providing this damping force. How? By electromagnetic induction. So this damping force happens because of electro electromagnetic induction. Deflecting force happens because of normal electromagnetic force. And the controlling for, uh, def deflection or the controlling force happens due to mechanical force. So remember all the three forces. Damping happens because of electromagnetic induction and that electromagnetic induction will generate eddy current and that is responsible for the damping force. <coughs> now what for we require the damping force? We require the damping force in order to prevent oscillation first of all. Without the damping force it can always overshoot. So in order to prevent overshooting we require damping force. And we also want that it takes up the final position quickly. It must not take long time to reach the final position. And for that also we require the damping force. So we need to remember the purpose of the damping force. The purpose of the damping force is to prevent oscillation first of all. In order to prevent overshooting. And we also want that the pointer reaches its final position in the quickest time. In order to reduce the time also we require the oscillating force. Okay, or the damping force. <coughs> Next, some definition regarding full scale current. What is full scale current? So the amount of current you require for full scale deflection is full scale current. If you require full scale deflection, the amount of current you require for that is full scale current. Next, there is one more term, ohm per volt sensitivity now ohm per volt sensitivity is inversely proportional to the full scale deflection generally for full scale deflection you require 1 milliampere of current so if you want to prevent because as I told you it is inversely proportional to the full scale deflection that means the amount of resistance you require in order to prevent this full scale deflection is the ohm per volt. Okay, The amount of resistance you require in order to prevent the full scale deflection. The full scale deflection happens if 1 milliampere current is generated. 
so the amount of resistance you need to put in per volt in order to prevent this full scale deflect, uh, deflection is what we call as the ohm per volt sensitivity which is inversely proportional to the full scale deflection now whenever we are talking about the internal resistance or the total resistance total internal resistance of the meter what we are referring to is the resistance because of the moving coil and the resistance because of the hair spring in the coil as you know the current starts flowing and with time the temperature would increase and with the increase in the temperature the resistance value gets increased and we need to counteract that so in order to counteract this we require compensating resistor so that the net resistance remains constant so this compensating resistor will have opposite characteristics that means with increase in temperature the resistance value must decrease so you need to remember what is the purpose of the compensating uh, resistor so a normal resistor whenever the current would flow the resistance value would <coughs> increase and in order to have a constant value of resistance we need something that would reduce the resistance with increase in temperature so that resistance that we are using in order to compensate for this rise of temperature we call this as the compensating resistor because our final objective is to ensure that the net resistance value remain constant okay any doubt so far next we'll specifically look into the three instruments initially is the ammeter it measures the current and in the ammeter how we convert the d arsenal meter into ammeter by putting some resistance in parallel and what is the reason for it because i don't need full scale deflection because if the entire amount of current goes in in that case the instrument can get damaged so what we do is i put a resistance which is having very less value of resistance i put a resistor with very less value of resistance in parallel to it and because now i put a resistor which is having very small value in parallel to the instrument so the maximum amount of current would pass through the small resistor so that very less amount of current now is actually moving into the instrument so i want less amount of current to pass to the meter and for this we are using a resistor in parallel and the resistance value is very less okay any doubt next is voltmeter it measure the voltage now in voltmeter we are using the resistance in series in ammeter we use the resistance in parallel whereas in voltmeter we will be using the resistance in series and we can use multiple resistor not just one resistance we can use multiple resistors and if we use multiple resistor in that case the range of the voltmeter can be increased so in order to increase the range of the voltmeter we can use multiple resistor in series and the meter sensitivity is again in terms of ohm per volt next is ohm meter it measures the resistance now how it measure the resistance just the very familiar formula v equal to ri 
So if I need to find out the resistance value, and if I know the amount of current I'm supplying, and generally the current is one milliampere, and if the voltage is known, in that case, based on that I can measure the resistance. Generally, in all typical instrument, we have got three uh, potential source, each having a value of 1.5 volt. So the net is 4.5. And if the current we are supplying, let's say, is 1 milliampere, so based on that, I can measure the resistance using V equal to. Now in ohmmeter, sometimes we use variable resistor and you need to remember it, why do we need to use variable resistor, what for it is used. The battery voltage can change over time because of its use and if that happens, it needs to be taken care of and that is why we use variable resistance. Okay. So to zero the ohmmeter, we use variable resistance. Why? Because with time, the voltage of the battery can change. And to zero, the initial reading of the ohmmeter we use variable resistor. Okay? Any doubt? So, what are the things you need to remember in the three instruments? Ammeter how you are converting the galvanometer or the arsenometer into ammeter by putting a resistor in parallel. In voltmeter, in series. Ohmmeter, we are using variable resistance. What is the purpose of using variable resistance? Because the battery voltage can change over time. And in that case, in order to ensure that it remains, the pointer stays at zero, we need to use the variable resistance. What is the purpose of ammeter? To measure the current. What for? We are using the uh, resistance in parallel in case of ammeter because if you are using the resistance in parallel in that case and if you are using small resistance in parallel in that case maximum amount of uh, the current will pass through the small resistor so that the minimum amount of current will actually pass through the instrument and that would prevent the instrument from having a full scale deflection. Voltmeter, what we use? We use resistance in series. And we use different or variable resistance. What is the purpose of using variable resistance? Because if we use variable resistance, in that case, the range of the voltage that we can measure, we can increase it. Okay? So that is all about the first part. This whole thing, whatever given, is what I told you just now, up to page 20. And these are the only things you are required to remember. And remaining whatever given in the book are all stories you can just ignore. Okay. Next, digital. Now from here on, you need to pay attention. So as I told you, in analog we are using current, whereas in digital we are using voltage. Now we are having 
the input the input is analog and that input i need to convert it into digital so that is what we call as adc you can see here adc a to d converter analog to digital converter and finally we are getting the digital and then the reverse we can also get the reverse convert the digital back into analog so d to a converter and in between you have got something called sample and hold hold and then you have got something called the comparator so what exactly it is and then in your book you can see here some informations given like 16 bit of configuration and uh, the speed in the range of 100 kbits per second so what exactly are these we'll try to look into this <clears throat> now the thing that you are required to remember that the process what exactly is digital signals it is the process of converting analog into some binary form that is digital signals now this conversion take place in two steps one of the step is called sampling and the other step is called quantization these things are not given in your book and to understand what all is written whatever you will be coming across in the next few pages that to understand those things you need to understand this basic concept so the entire conversion happens in two steps one is sampling and another is quantization so what exactly is this now if you try to think of any electrical signals as you know <coughs> any of these electromagnetic signals are let's we just look into the electrical signals in the sinusoidal pattern now this electrical signals whatever we are plotting we are assuming that each and every point the time period is infinite and we are considering each and every point along this line now instead of assuming that the time is continuous instead of taking the continuous time if i take some discrete time one time interval another time interval third time interval so i am taking individual time discrete time instead of taking the continuous time i am breaking it down into discrete values of time now once i am taking individual time next what i am required to do is approximate it and that's what more or less is all about so we are not taking continuous time we are taking discrete time okay now if we are taking discrete time what exactly happens so this part we will try to look into with more detail so just this part half of this period and now the sinusoidal okay to make it easier maybe we just look into a straight line a straight line and stretching it out if something is like this stretching it out means we just need to multiply something so if this is let's say cos of something x if i am multiplying this one then that means i am stretching it it becomes this one so we multiply with certain things it becomes a stretched and from this curve i can get a straight a linear so i am getting it something linear now this is given the entire graph is defined in this entire time interval and this is analog we don't want this 
because this has got some unnecessary information as well and you don't want unnecessary information so how can i cut out those unnecessary information so that we are taking some time interval let's say this is one zero this is two this is three so now i am taking this i am taking this i am taking in some time interval only not the entire uh, time now this is equivalent to zero let's say this is a three bit so if it is three bit information so this is zero 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 starting next will be one so one means it is zero zero one correct right after one comes two so zero one one sorry zero then comes three so zero this this then four why i am taking i will be taking eight there is a reason for it this this is four five six seven how to write seven four five six seven total eight one two three four five six okay so what exactly it says the different number of ways by which two bit of information i can write in three bit form it is two to the power three if i need to write this in 8 bit form so it will be 2 to the power 8 16 to the power 16 i am writing this in 3 bit form and these are all the possible ways now let us assume this is the voltage or the current so this voltage now i am distributing in 8 different ways so each one is contributing one voltage divided by 8 discrete in time interval 1 by 8 so one divided by 8 the value will get i carried out the division you will get 0.128 So zero to one to eight volt is the minimum potential if we are discreting it, and this is the analog equivalent of this digital. So now zero 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 is equivalent to zero volt. Analog analog equivalent to zero 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 is zero. Now analog equivalent. Of zero zero one is zero point one two five. Now, for this plus this is this one. This is the digital equivalent of if I add it up. And finally, one voltage, one volt is equivalent to one one one. So that is how we convert this. Now, instead of three bits, if I get more bits, because with three bits, I am dividing this into eight equal intervals. Because three bits two to the power three. If I use eight bits, in that case, it will be two to the power eight. Quite large we'll have. Very very big. That means. the more bits i am using the more precise i will get so the precision will get increased if you are using more bits 
We can use 16 bits, we can use 32 bits, we can use 64 bits, and we can also use 128 bits. Now, one of the videos that I did in my YouTube channel regarding cracking and hacking of credit card. So that one, your credit card, all the numbers are given in 128 bits. So imagine the possible combination. And that equivalent uh, analog, the, if you get the number, that number is, you can think of how big that number will be. And that also is a prime number. And that is not the end of the story. Now, this one, whatever number, whatever the value of digit at the extreme left. So that is known as MSB. For the time being, you remember that it is known as MSB. You will get all this term in your book. Whenever you go through this book, you will get this term without specifying what MSB is. Do you, do you know what is MSB? They have given all terms MSB and all these things. So you will get this term MSB. MSB stands for the most significant digit. The digit which is at the extreme left is the most significant digit and the digit which is in the extreme right is the lsb lowest significant uh, digit the smallest one so whatever in the extreme left is msb whatever is in the extreme right is lsb Now, if we reverse it or the sequence of writing a number at the front, at the extreme left, highest one followed by the, this pattern, this pattern of writing number is known as little endian. You have got the highest number here, MSB. Any number you get, let's say this one. So MSB for this is this one. Minimum significant bits. Oh, sorry. Uh, most, not minimum, most. Most significant bit. Most significant bit is the one at the left, and the least significant bit is the one at the extreme right. And this way of writing any bits from high to low, this sequence is known as big endian sequence. Big Indian sequence. You can reverse it, writing the lowest at the extreme left and highest at the extreme right. And if you do that, then it is known as little Indian sequence. Big Indian sequence and little Indian sequence. And you can also change this and scramble it. Maybe the big somewhere is in the middle and without any sequence. And that is how whenever you text any message in your WhatsApp, it is written in, like you know, the message you send in encrypted form. Encrypted form means these are neither in uh, big Indian sequence nor in little Indian sequence, but the sequence is scrambled so that you cannot make out the sequence because if you can make out the sequence you can know exactly what it is written you can decrypt it because it is difficult to get the exact sequence because if you know the exact sequence best like you know it is one zero zero one or something whatever it is 
So let's say you send a message. Message, let's say very simple message, love. You want to send this message. If you type love in your WhatsApp. So how exactly the thing goes? Now, L, if you try to, what, what number is L? What in the alphabet? A, B, C, D, what number? L? O? Hmm? V? E? Any of this number, it is written in terms of mod 10. Divide by 10. Whatever you get 2. Divide by 10. Remember 5. Divide by 10. 12. Remember 2. This divided by, you cannot divide it. So, I keep it like this. Now, maybe cube it. 2 cube, 5 cube, 2 cube again, 5 cube again. Whatever number we get, take the last bit and get the next prime number. Whatever number you get, convert the equivalent into this. Then scramble it. So that's how individual letter is scrambled. So imagine how difficult it is to even know individual letter if you want to decrypt it. So difficult. So, what we have seen so far is we got something called quantization. Quantization means I am taking discrete value. No, because I am taking discrete value, value, so that means in the digital, if I am taking the converting from analog to digital, so in analog I am having this much, whole thing. Whereas in digital, I am having this, 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 this problem. So I have got infinite number of points here, and here I got limited number of points. And conversion is all about mapping all this to this. So it is many one mapping. So one output and I could have lot of inputs and because with one output I can have lots and lots of out output so that is why irreversible is not possible. So it is not possible to irreverse it. Reversible is not possible. I cannot reverse it because for one output I could have thousands of inputs. So we don't know which input need to be taken. So this whole process is irreversible and the mapping itself is non-linear because with this particular output I can have this many inputs, with this I can have this many inputs, so the whole mapping is non-linear and at the same time it is many one and that is why it is not reversible, irreversible. Now these are the basic concepts. Why you need to remember this? Because whenever you will be studying whatever it is given in your book, you need to know, if you do not know these basic concepts, you cannot understand the, what exactly those sentences meant. So the conversion from analog to digital involves two steps. One is quantization, the one that I mentioned, and another is sampling. 
Now the difference between the input and the output is known as quantization error. The difference between the input and the output is known as quantization error. Now, in sampling, so far I told you about quantization. It is the process of mapping. So, quantization is the process of mapping the output which is limited to inputs which are many. And this function is more or less continuous. So, this is continuous function and if I need to map this with this, it will be many one and because it is many one so it is irreversible i cannot reverse it and this whole process is known as quantization and the difference between the output and the input is known as the quantization error now what is sampling now sampling is the process of converting this continuous time varying voltage into discrete time varying so continuous into discrete this process of converting is sampling and this sampling whenever we are doing i can do it in 3 bit i can do it in 8 bits i can do it in 16 bits more the bits you are using more uh, correct will be our reading because we are approximating and this whole thing from here to here I am not taking the entire point I am taking few points and I am approximating these points so more the points I am taking more will be my or better will be my approximation so the error will be minimum if I use more bits okay more the bits lesser will be the error because if I got more bits that means like with two uh, sorry with three bits we have got total eight now with four to the power of four is sixteen so I will have sixteen so that means individual one volt now will be divided into sixteen small chunks if I'm using five bits then two to the power of five thirty two so that means one volt now I am dividing into 32 small chunks. So each part will be 1 divided by 32. So I can have better approximation. So more the bits, more will be the approximation. We will have better approximation. So this is sampling and quantization. Now, based on this two concept, whatever I told you so far, in your book, the diagram is given regarding the digital DMM. DMM stands for digital multimeter. The layout diagram is given. So you can see here in the, you no, know, they've given something called sample and hold in the diagram. Right, sample and hold. So sample and hold sampling the one that I told you discreting. From continuous time interval, I am having discrete time interval. Now sample and hold, this is an analog device. It samples the voltage continuously over some period and then take some of it and convert that into discrete. It is a memory device. 
and these are mainly used to eliminate all the variations any type of variation some abnormal noise or anything the di basic difference between analog and digital if a movie let's say is digitally mastered so you can hear the sound to be very crisp so unnecessary things we are filtering out now what exactly it uses it uses a capacitor it uses fet it uses operational amplifier and it also uses buffer amplifier you know this fet buffer amplifier Studied FET, right? Yes. So the capacitor is connected to the buffer amplifier via FET. FET is acting like a switching circuit. FET in this case is switch. Either it is allowing. the input signal to be fed to the amplifier or it is resisting it only two ways this capacitor is storing the charge from where it is storing the charge from the amplifier so what you need to remember is this sample and hold device it is basically an analog instrument which sample the voltage and it samples the voltage of continuously variable voltage and convert that into discrete voltage it is some sort of a memory device where it retains all the information and in this whole process of doing it requires three individual component to work it uses fet which acts like a switch it uses a uh, amplifier buffer amplifier and it uses the capacitor the purpose of the capacitor is to store the charge so capacitor is just acting as a charge source it is storing the charge static charge buffer amplifier it charges or discharges the capacitor to ensure voltage across the capacitor is constant so we need to ensure that the voltage across the capacitor is constant there is a mode called hold mode so in hold mode as the name suggests sample and hold so it is sampling lot of inputs it is sampling taking some random values discrete value and then it is because it is varying over a continuous time period i am holding it retaining it for certain period of time so that is the holding time so that is the hold mode so in hold mode the switch that means the fet it disconnects the capacitor from the amplifier because if you recall what i told you just now we have got the fet which is connecting the capacitor to the buffer amplifier so in hold mode it is disconnecting so if it is disconnecting that means whatever charge is being stored now in the capacitor need to be discharged and it discharges the those current on its own that is known as the leakage current so it discharges it by its own leakage current and the useful load current now the input voltage so it charges the capacitor buffer amplifier charges the capa uh, capacitor and in the process 
it measured the voltage. And whenever it measured the voltage, it keeps the capacitance constant. And the input voltage, the voltage it measures is proportional to the input voltage. Now the purpose of this FET as I told you it acts like a switch. It allows the flow of current and the flow of current is being controlled by the voltage and it is measuring the voltage. The output you are getting is voltage and the input is also the voltage. So we are having input as voltage, output as voltage and we are having some FAT which is acting like a switch either it is allowing or not allowing. How it is doing so? By controlling the current. It is controlling the current through the, because we know FAT got three terminals through the gate. And source means the input and drain is there. So it uses the the purpose of the FET as if you recall it uses the electric field to flow the uh, to control the flow of current and that's exactly what it is doing. It is using the electric field to control the flow of current. How it is generating or getting the electric field because of the capacitance. We have got this operational amplifier because we are, we are taking so many inputs and then we are getting one output. So taking all this differential input and getting one output out of it, the, that is being done by the uh, operational amplifier, taking differential input and converting that into single output. Buffer amplifier. It provides the electrical impedance. What for? For transformation. From one circuit, if I got one circuit, and then from one circuit I need to get into another circuit for that the transformation to take place, we require buffer amplifier. So that is uh, all about sample and hold. So what exactly it does? We have got a lot of inputs running over time. I don't want all the inputs. I require discrete. So I am taking these discrete values. Now these discrete values are random values, not exactly random. We require, we are dividing that into specific time. How we are dividing, in what time interval we are dividing, that depends on the quantization. So we are taking so many quantized value take approximating it taking certain and then we are uh, getting the output now because i have got lot of inputs and i have got very few outputs so i cannot measure it i cannot map it and that is why it is irreversible process i cannot reverse it once it it is only moving this way not in the other way because i do not know exactly what exact is the input because i am taking so many input and just taking few outputs so i cannot map it so whenever I am taking all this uh, from so many output along the entire time interval and because I am taking some quantized value, so I need to hold it, there are lot of samples along the entire time interval and out of this I am taking some discrete, so I am sampling it out and holding it for certain period of time and that is where we call this sample and hold. So we are taking some input, we are getting some output. The input is voltage, output is also voltage. And in getting, taking all this input voltage and converting that into single output voltage, so many input and converting that into one output. So for that I require operational amplifier. 
I have got the input, I have got the output and now the change in the voltage happens and the relationship between input and output we need some switch in between and that switch is the FET because I need to store the static charge and to store the static charge I require capacitor so capacitor is also part of this sample and hole so the sample and hole consists of FET capacitor and the amplifier each has got its own function and that's all about sample and holding and charging and discharging of uh, the capacitor happens because of the amplifier and during the discharge of the capacitor if you are removing the FET so it discharge on its own due to leakage current and also due to the load current Now this ABC, we can have different types. One is flash ABC. Another name for it is parallel ABC. It has got comparator, encoder, and the digital display. Now this comparator what is the purpose it compares the input as the name suggests comparator that means it is comparing something now it is the input it is comparing with a unique reference voltage so input and unique reference voltage so this comparator is actually driven by variable uh, resistance we have got resistance dividers and those resistance dividers are dividing uh, sorry are moving the comparator and this comparator compares the input with the unique reference voltage now if the input is greater than the reference voltage in that case it would allow the information to pass to the encoder and the encoder will drive the digital display so remember we have got comparator we have got encoder and we have got digital display what is comparator comparator is something which is comparing what it is comparing it is comparing the input voltage to a set of reference voltage this comparator individually is driven by variable resistance so in the com comparator we have got one input the input voltage and then we have got some reference voltage so it is comparing both so if it happens that the input voltage is more than the reference voltage in that case it will allow the information to be fed to the encoder encoder for generating the binary
and whenever it is now what binary information it would generate that would be based on the MSB most significant digit oh sorry uh, uh, most significant bits in your book it is mentioned about successive approximation AD converter SAR this one is the modern one <coughs> so we are taking lot of these values and we are converging those input values in a output we are getting and this also contains the comparator it contains something called output latches then successive approximation register and also the digital to analog converter and that is what you can see in the in your diagram given in your book it has got both analog to digital and digital to analog and if you go through your book the lines you will find that they have got this term SAR and all can you see SAR in your book written C a lot of times SAR is written so it converges the analog input voltage to its closest value now SAR SAR stands for successive approximation SAR is reset as the low to high transition low to high means I am talking about the arrangement of the bits low to high the MSB of SAR is reset based on this transition from low to high and the output is given to the digital to analog converter and this they compare with the input if the output value is low in the comparator then it is cleared by the SAR and the thing moves if not the next higher bit is set and this will continue till all the bits are being used Are you getting me? Yes or no? Yes or no? I cannot read your mind. If you do not say, how will I know whether you understand or not? Yes or no? Huh? Then why don't you tell? We have got <coughs> many inputs and I need to convert those many inputs into some outputs in successive approximation analog to digital converter what they and how they use is the basic is again same we require quantization we require hold on all these things are same now here it is a successive approximation so what exactly it means is there is always a transition starting from so what th that means I am converting some analog value let's say 2 3 4 5 whatever it is to some digital value okay some 1 volt 2 volt 1.5 1.6 1.7 some voltage reading analog voltage reading when converting it into digital so we'll start off with the lowest lowest in the digital 
okay so we'll start with the lowest now whatever the output we are getting we'll compare the output with the input if the output from the comparator is lower than the input then no problem sir will clear that and the information will pass but if the output is not less than the input in that case the next bit will come and this will repeat until all the bits are being used and then the whole thing will get approximated are you getting me now i have got this information this sr stands for successive successive means one after another a stands for approximation so successive approximation is happening where in the analog to digital converter this contain the comparator first of all so comparator means it will, it will compare the input with some reference as we have seen so it will compare something it will have something called latches output latch latch means something no holding something is latch so and then we have got successive approximation register so something which will register some approximate values and then finally we will have the digital to analog converter the opposite so this sir it is set as from low to high transition and then the msb of the sir is reset from low to high msb what msb stands for most significant bits so most significant bits so lowest to most will go okay will go from lowest to most and we will be setting so that it reaches from lowest to most and the output No, no, not from lowest to most. From most to lowest, MSB. So, <clears throat> from highest maximum to minimum. That's how we'll be setting. So, we have got some output. Now, that output is fed to the like we're, we're having some output, and the output is given to the digital analog converter, digital to analog. and they will compare this with the input now if it happens that the output value is low then the input if the output value is low than the input in that case it will be cleared by the sir if the output value is not low than the input in that case it will turn and will take the next bit successive and then one more and will keep on repeating this until all the bits are completely used i don't know 0 0 1 0 1 0 until all are being continuously from here to here let's say it is a three bits so i am using it until all these bits are being used okay
understand whatever i told you so far so digital analog converter how it functions i told you now you see it is written speed is 10k bits per second so that means how it is changing the speed of this one I see successive approximation ADC. Just I told you just now what is successive approximation. One after another. If it is clearing, if not, if not getting cleared by SIR, in that case take the next one and we will be using the entire thing and then approximate. So that is successive approximation ADC. MSB it is written correct so you can see here MSB set to 1 and all the remaining bits set to 0 assuming that the input voltage could be anywhere in the range input voltage could be anywhere in this range The mid range means the ADC is able to provide a faster display setting time. The ADC output is fed to the digital and to analog converter and the resulting analog presentation is fed to the comparator. So as I told you input and output and then it will compare. The comparator compares this analog with that of the input if the output a DC output is less than the analog input the logic one is removed just now as I told you if it is lower it will clear off if not go for the next so if it is if the output is less than the analog analog input that means less it will be cleared off so it will pass so that means logic one is removed and the no, next lower bit is set to logic one so we are taking the highest one and then successively we are reducing it on the subsequent control logic clock pulse okay <coughs> sampling I told a lot about sampling so here they have mentioned very less about sampling <coughs> and then these are some of the definitions that you need to remember switch time from one measurement to another measurement if you are measuring voltage and then after voltage you want to measure the current and after current maybe you need to measure the resistance the, the switch time allows for changing between either of these function so it is the time required for the <coughs> instrument to settle after the input, input selector has been adjusted after you adjust it you need to allow certain amount of time for it to settle so that is known as the switch time remember this definition all these definitions settling time once the value is measured and has been applied to the input a certain time is required for it to settle you apply you take the lead attach it and then you need certain time for it to settle so that is the settling time signal measurement time this is the time required to make the measurement itself the amount of time we require to measure the signal 
for ac measurement the frequency of the input is determined and four times the waveform period is calculated this is then applied as signal measuring time for example frequency of 400 hertz has a periodic time of 2.5 therefore the measurement time will be 10 meter per second auto zero time in some dmm and auto range selection is available when this is selected a manual range change is made it is necessary to zero the meter to ensure accuracy auto zero whenever the time it takes for it to return back to the zero adc calibration time a calibration is periodically performed this must be accounted for especially when where measurements are taken under automatic or con computer control resolution so these digits we are using so normally how many digit 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 eight isn't it or seven what seven not eight <coughs> this entire digit is referred to as five and half digit display remember it five and half digit now exactly what five and half digit means if you count individual by convention a half digit can display either zero or one while three quarter digit are can display a number higher than one but not nine now if it says a three quarter digit can display a number higher than 1 three quarter higher than 1 isn't it only two means one more than that is higher digit correct are you getting or not what you count this one 1 2 1 2 3 4 you count this one What happened to this? Session. you count this one the resolution of a digital meter is often specified in digits of resolution for example the term 2 and half digit refer to the number of digits displayed on the readout of the meter by convention a half digit can display either a 0 or a 1 while a three quarter digit can display a number higher than 1 but not 9 the fractional digit is always the most significant in the displayed value a five and half digit meter would have five full digit and display values from 0 to 9 now what are the digit it can display 0 to 9 correct so this is okay right 0 to 9 and one half digit that could display 0 and 1 now this one if i need point that also need to be displayed yes or no correct so either we will have point or we don't have point right so that means it is either 1 or 
so this half means either 1 or 0 if it is displaying 1 if it is not displaying 0 ok such a meter could show positive or negative value from 0 to this many again try to look at the by convention a half digit can display either 0 or 1 while a 3 quarter digit can display a number higher than 1 but not 9 3 quarter digit what do you mean by 3 quarter digit can display a number higher than 1 but not 9 if you are using 9 1 9 and 4 what difference do you notice in these 3 if you look at each of these can you notice some difference based on whatever it is written here the resolution of a digit meter is often specified in digits of resolution for example the term to five and a half digit refer to number of digits displayed on the readout so it refers to the number of digits so one two three four number of digits so one two three four five six seven or on the number of digit one two three four five six isn't it right what else can you think based on what it is written here? A half digit can display either 0 or 1 while a 3 quarter digit. What is 3 quarter digit? What is three quarter digit? We have studied electrical electronics, right? Then what is three three quarter digit? Try to find out and tell me tomorrow. Accuracy. <coughs> how accurate it is depending on how many significant digits it can measure. More the significant digit it can measure, more is the accuracy. So the accuracy is in the range of plus minus one percentage. So quite natural digital is more accurate than analog <coughs>